There is no greater gift to give someone than the truth of how much Jesus loves them. I love these times that I get to reflect on where Life Without Limbs as a ministry has been. And by the grace of God, all the opportunities to go around the world into these nations and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the truth, and the power of the resurrection of Jesus. It is the most precious gift that we could ever communicate to anyone. Traveling 60 countries, 3 million miles, which is from Earth to Moon and back six times, it's been nothing but an amazing, humbling experience to see the faces and hearts change as they hear that God loves them and has a plan for them too. We've had the joy and privilege of sharing His love with orphans, with people who are poor and needy and enslaved, to even presidents face to face, one on one, behind closed doors. And after speaking at congresses and governmental meetings, they asked me to share the gospel on their mainstream TV. And then seeing these stadiums filled and people, crowds of people coming forward every single time to respond to the power of the gospel. It's been awesome to see 10% of any audience, by the grace of God, respond, repent of their sins, and give their life to Jesus. I tell you, there's nothing more fulfilling than that. Words cannot express what joy it gives life without limbs to see people with special needs and their families find liberty and opportunity as they have a new level of integration in society after our ministry's presence in their country. We are praying for the next generation of the United States of America, these teenagers who've never seen the Jesus movement, to experience a transformation and move of Jesus within their hearts and souls. We want them to find the purpose that God has for them and the joy that God has ordained from the beginning of time for them. When I see these people find hope because of God, it has been nothing but an amazing and humbling experience to see where we've been, but we know that we haven't even scratched the surface of where God wants us to go. These exciting last 10 years has been awesome, but we know that there are 7 billion people in the world, and by the grace of God, with your support and your love, we've been able to reach one-tenth of the entire population of the world. And I'm asking you to partner with us and have another 6.4 billion souls reached with the truth of how much Jesus loves them too. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor John, and greetings, uh, Pastor Wayne, if you're watching, and everyone else watching online. Can we welcome everyone watching online as well? I want to thank you for having me back here at the church. Uh, really, really excited to announce that uh, this November and next November, God willing, uh, I'll be coming back and ministering on the islands here. And uh, I wanted to, uh, wanted to share with you some exciting news um, of our travels. Um, oh, I just saw you put up the family photo. I can do that. Yeah, we can do that first. Uh, first of all, the greatest news I can share with you uh, is this family photo. Uh, if for those of you who haven't seen my family, um, my wife, Kane, she's half Japanese, half Mexican. We call that Japsican. And um, we have two boys, Kiyoshi and Dayan, four and two years old. And uh, my wife's now expecting identical twins, uh, which is so cool. So, God surprises us with more, way more blessings than we feel we can handle sometimes. But we are so, so blessed uh, to be now a family of six. And uh, I'm just so thankful to be back here. And I don't know how many of you have heard me speak face to face. Can you raise your hand if you've never heard me speak face to face before? Okay, cool. Put your hand down. All right, that's about 60, 70% of you. Um, did you like that video? Yeah. 
Um, we uh, moved from Australia when I was 23 years old. In 2005, we established Life Without Limbs and uh, been on two and a half thousand airplanes over 10 years. Uh, I was just with two presidents last week in the Balkan region. Europe is uh, a, on, a, on a beautiful, beautiful year of, of opportunity right now, west and east, where uh, 2017, they're celebrating 500 years of reformation where they allowed Protestant churches to practice. So governments, TV time, and education systems have to talk about faith in God uh, out of respect to the Christians. Uh, so we're really excited. I was able to speak in front of the Ukrainian government last year, uh, and they invited me back uh, this year to actually be on the steps of the city of Kiev in front of a million people face-to-face -face, uh, with eight neighboring countries watching in 15 different languages. Uh, so in one day, uh, coming up in six weeks' time, 100 million estimated, 80% of all the countries we estimate will actually be watching. So 100 million people will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're really, really excited. And uh, uh, real quick, a seven-year prayer came, came to pass. Uh, I'm going to show you a photo of a truck. Uh, There's a 53-foot trailer that Life Without Limbs now has in stewardship of a tent inside. Uh, it's an 8,000 person tent, 64,000 square feet uh, under one roof. Uh, a third of that tent right now is currently up in Ventura County, uh, not for teaching, not for evangelizing, not, not talking, just prayer and worship for a month, all the month of August, starting Tuesday. Uh, we're trying to bring a unity of churches there like never before to mobilize, evangelize in the fall. Uh, so that tent will be up in October for two weeks straight, God willing, 100,000 people coming through the tent in 14 days and 10,000 souls for Jesus. So uh, we're so excited. And uh, so far in four services, we've had roughly 300 people come forward here uh, in this building in the last 24 hours who gave their life to Jesus Christ. So let's give God a, a shout of praise. And I'll be bold in my faith to announce, I really believe in, in several years to come, not too far, um, that I really believe God wants to fill up Aloha Stadium for many, many days straight for the glory of God. And I, um, I love Hawaii, I love to vacation here, but I also know the heaviness and burden of, of carrying the, the prayers for the islands. Uh, we know uh, I've been to 19 schools here in Hawaii in two weeks. Uh, I've spoken at your state legislature about teen suicide and bullying. And so I know the next generation's uh, uh, burdens that, that you're praying for. And so I stand with you in prayer as I ask you to stand with us in prayer as we move forward on both fronts. But um, may God bless you, new hope for what you're doing in Hawaii. And um, I don't know if you're sometimes a person who takes notes. I'm going to probably mention around seven or eight different verses that if you at least write the references down, um, because you could go home and people can say, well, was it good? And you're like, yeah, it was awesome. What do you say? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but these verses are the verses that you can always go back to um, because we all go through ups and downs, right? You see my foot? Ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. <laughs> And these are the verses that, uh, some of the verses that are written on the tablet of my heart. Uh, the verses that I always go back to, to, to bring my faith back up. Sometimes we, we struggle with, with a lack of courage. Sometimes we get discouraged with the broken pieces that we see of our life or maybe other people around us. And if I can just kindly ask you to just up my volume just a tiny bit, it's the fifth service, so my voice isn't as strong. That's perfect. Thank you so much. But I, uh, first of all, want to tell you all that I love you. Uh, so 70% of you haven't heard me speak face to face. I'm sure you may be seeing a little bit of YouTube stuff, but um, I was born in Australia. Um, no one knows what I was born this way. Lady Gaga don't know what I was born this way. Um, 
And I, I don't know what you're going through. I always tell teenagers, I always believe it's worse being in a broken home than having no arms and legs. And what I want to tell you is I'm a preacher with, with what you see is what you get with me. I, I hold no punches back. Um, and I just want to be real with you. I want to talk about real hope. I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know your struggles. Uh, but I hope that you're encouraged uh, with knowing that uh, a man without arms and legs, if God can use a man without arms and legs, not just to be complete, but really use him to be his hands and feet, uh, then God can use any willing heart. And I want to be real raw with you a little bit and um, start off with telling you that I, I, I want to tell you that, that it's so difficult to be able to prove that God exists in some aspects. But what I want to do is maybe break down some thoughts of some of you who make uh, some, some good questions posed as to the goodness of God. If God is a loving God, uh, then really, why is there pain? It's a great question. If God is a fair God, then why did he let the serpent in the Garden of Eden? If God is a good God, then what happens to the people who never hear about him? If God is a good God and he loves us, then why does he let us remain in pain sometimes? Now, you're looking at a limbless guy who has a pair of shoes in his closet just in case God says yes. <laughs> and we know that God can hear our prayers and we know he's real. But sometimes we don't see the full picture. Um, I love to play tricks on people and freak people out sometimes. I don't know if you've seen the YouTube video of me actually dressed up as the pilot and greeting the passengers as they get on the plane. Um, it is on YouTube. It was so cool. Some people gave their life to Jesus right there and then. Um, and uh, we, we have our fun and definitely an unforgettable moment. I was in a car one day. And we're at the traffic lights and this car comes up next to us and this girl's looking at me and all she sees is my head from the side. So she doesn't see the rest of my body. So just imagine all you see is my head. Ready? I just did this. <laughs> and she thought my head did a 360 degree spin. And her face was like, <laughs> like it was so good. But I just want you to know that, that in your life, you know, we, we really need to make some decisions, sometimes difficult decisions. And some of us feel like sometimes there are no decisions to make. Like, I did not decide to be born. Uh, my dad, unfortunately, he passed away uh, to cancer about 10 weeks ago. We buried him. But he knew the Lord. And when you go through different struggles, you, you question the bigger questions like, who am I? Why am I here? Uh, is this it? Do we just live to die? Is there something more to my life? And that was basically the, the realm of questioning that I had as a kid. When I looked at all the kids uh, at school and they had arms and legs, I wondered, why not me? Um, and I prayed for arms and legs, and I had a big, big, uh, you know, avocado seed of faith. Not a little mustard seed of faith, avocado seed of faith. And I knew that, you know, God was real, and I understood the, the, you know, I, I felt he was real. I felt, you know, that, that heaven would be amazing and, and I would love to believe in eternal life. I knew that I was a sinner. I mean, I knew that. You don't have to look real deep in anyone's life to figure out, well, if you lied once, you're a liar. If you steal once, you're a thief. If you're jealous, well, that's a sin. Really? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. And so, I'm thinking, okay, well, I know I'm a sinner, and I know the gospel message. I understand, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I understood why. I understood the death because I know that if I get a speeding ticket and Pastor John is so loving and kind that he pays for my speeding ticket, thank you, Pastor John, then I know I don't have to pay my speeding fine because someone else paid for it. Likewise, if I'm going to a cinema and he pays for my ticket, I don't have to go to the box office. But if I've done something wrong and someone who hasn't done that thing wrong actually paid the price for it, then I know I don't have to pay the price for it because someone else paid for it. So for my sin, which is death on the cross, now because Jesus paid the price for my sin, I don't die for my sin. I understood all that in theory and theology, but what I didn't get was, why me? And why not arms and legs? 
And I want to ask you a question. In fact, two questions today. Who are you and what do you want? Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 31. I'm going to put that up on the screen first. And it reads this. We'll just wait for it. Sorry. Yep. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's go to the first part of that verse. It says, those who wait upon the Lord. Who likes waiting? Does anyone like waiting? I don't like waiting. I hate waiting. Who would like more patience? I would like more patience, right? What does that mean? Don't you actually have to practice patience before you actually get more patience? And you can't really practice patience unless you're in a position of waiting. So it's kind of a catch-22. But when you understand the goodness of God and you wait upon the Lord, and not just for a circumstantial change. Now let's take it to the extreme. For my dad, example. 62 years old, pancreatic cancer. He was given eight weeks to live. God gave him 15 or 16 months. We were so thankful for that extra time. Did we pray for my dad's healing? Yes. Did we have faith? Yes. Is God basically all-knowing and can do all things and God is God? Yes. Did he heal my dad? No. You see, a citizen of heaven passes through earth and we don't remain here. This is not our home. You know, you know that in your life, well, if I can just get this then everything's going to be okay. But then you get what you want sometimes and you figure out it's not what you need. Or if I can just get a little bit more money and you get a little bit more money and then what do you say? What if I could just get a little bit more money, right? And you realize really quickly that these temporary things on this earth do not satisfy your soul. But if I know that I'm going to heaven and I know my dad's in heaven, that's why we can bury him in peace. And for me, I look at life going around the world, 65 countries, 3,000 stages, 16 presidents, 9 governments, billionaires, and the orphans and the sex slaves. And I realized in my life, not only in my own faith journey, but even talking to people in the most extreme cases of hopelessness, that Jesus brings hope to any person who has broken pieces, who say, God, I can't do this in my life. I want to believe in heaven, and I don't want to be afraid of death, and I want your peace. God, take my broken pieces, because I can't do anything with my regrets, my shame, my guilt, my past, my failures. I can't even forgive myself. Take over. And for me, that day was age 15. But I want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for stress to kind of be taken away or something that should be given to you or an achievement or a, a whole different season of life? Because I tell you, man, I talk to eight-year-olds and I ask them sometimes a really cool question. Are there any eight-year-olds here? Put your hand up if you're eight years old. Any nine-year-olds? Any eight, nine-year-olds? A couple of you? Yeah, I see you. You know what I ask these nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds all the time? I say, hey, guys, have you ever been stressed? And they're like, uh-huh. And I'm like, what's stressing you out? And they say, oh, homework is so hard. And my parents, they don't give me everything I want. And my brother and my sister, they annoy me every single day. Right? They're so stressed out. Then you talk to 13-year-olds, and they're totally stressed out. They're like, oh, everything's changing around me. I don't even know who I am anymore. My parents, they don't understand me. I put a do not disturb sign on my door, and they still come into my room, and they freak me out. I need my privacy. I need to figure this out. I'm so stressed out right now. My friends, they, they, they invite me to the party. Then, then they uninvite me to the party. Like, what's with that? And, and you know what? I'm just so stressed out right now. I think I just need a boyfriend. <laughs> That's a 13-year-old life right there and then. Just a snippet of it. 17-year-olds, they can't wait to get out of high school. If I can just get out of high school and get into college, then everything's going to be 
Okay. They get into college and is everything okay? No. Now they need money. <laughs> oh, if I can just find a job, then everything's going to be okay. They finally get their job and is everything okay? After two days, they look at their boss in the face and they look at God and they say, really? You gave me him? I hate him. And then all the single people, they're like, oh, I can't wait to get married. That's when I'm going to be complete. If I can just find the one, then everything's going to be okay. No. Go talk to some married people. If you're not happy single, you're not going to be happy married. Can you hear an amen? amen. Those are the married people clapping. <laughs> right? And so often we look for things horizontally that will complete us and restore really what's missing in our soul. For me, it was arms and legs. If I just had arms and legs, then everything's going to be okay. But you know what my disability really was? I didn't know the truth. The truth sets me free. The truth changes everything. Because when you don't know the truth, you believe in the lies. The lies of what people think of you. The lies of what you even think of you based on what you think others, pe others think of you. Which may actually not be true anyway. I wish I was more beautiful. I wish I was taller. I wish I was this. I wish I was more popular. I wish I had a boyfriend to feel love. <laughs> Girls, for as long as you're looking for a boyfriend, you're going to find a boyfriend. But you don't need a boyfriend. You need a man of God who's going to be your husband to stand by you no matter what. Who's going to love and raise your kids up in the ways of the Lord. He's got to be the spiritual leader of the home. If he can't put God first in his life now, before you're married, how do you expect that he's going to put God first after you get married in his life? It's the first experience for anyone to put someone else in front of them. It's putting God in front of their life. Because if they don't know how to put God in front of their life, then how are they going to put your needs above their needs? When you understand, guys, that you don't need to say the F word to be cool. You don't need to be a bully to be popular. You don't need to get drunk like everyone else. You go from temporary high to temporary high, but you still feel empty and sad and lonely. You think, then you figure out, well, if I can just get big biceps and, you know, everything's going, no, nah, man, my biceps were so big they fell off, all right? <laughs> And God has a plan for us, a future and a hope. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, 12, 13, and 14a. So Jeremiah 29, 11-14a. We're only going to read the 11th verse. It says this. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. God's got a good plan for you. And that's what my parents always said. Nick, don't worry. We love you. God loves you. You're special. And I'm like, I don't want to be special, right? <laughs> but you don't know what beautiful things can come from your broken pieces until you give your broken pieces a chance. I had no idea at age 34 that God would send me around the world and preach the gospel to millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. That's insane. I had no idea that I would ever meet a limbless little boy at age 24 in Southern California who was 19 months old. I was 24 years old, and I got him up here. I'm like, man, you are so cool. I want to wrestle you, man. <laughs> And I got him up in front of everyone, and he looked up at me, and I looked at him, and I couldn't give him a high five, so I put my little foot in his foot, and he smiled. When he smiled, everyone cried. Then I saw my parents hug and cry with his parents. And I told his mom, when he goes to school and he gets bullied, I'm coming to his school in my wheelchair. I'm going to run them all over. <laughs> 
no, that's not the Christian thing to do, okay? <laughs> but I went there, he was getting teased, and after a 15-minute speech, he was the most admired and respected student. And I thought to myself, wow, when God doesn't give me a miracle, he can still use me to be a miracle. Why am I here? What do I want? I want Daniel to know Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And God gives us the truth of our value. That I'm not just a man without arms and legs. I'm a child of God. Psalm 139 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He has more precious thoughts of me than all the grains of sand in the world. Romans 8.28 all things come together for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I can call you, but you may not pick up the phone. I can leave you a voicemail, but you may not return my call. I can Instagram you, Facebook you, I can do whatever I want, but it's up to you to respond before we connect. Does that make sense? He reaches out his hand to you and you've got to answer the call. You've got to pick up the phone. You are called according to his purpose. He's not going to force you to believe in him. He gave you free choice. But what you must believe is that there is a spiritual realm. There is someone who loves you so much and his name is God whose son is Jesus Christ. And there is someone who hates me and his name is the devil, Lucifer. And he doesn't want me to know God. And every day you wake up, there is a spiritual realm. I love talking with atheists, man. I really do. Because you know what they say? Science explains everything. But I know it does not. Man, when you see a 10 foot tall, 4 foot wide demon walking through a wall of a San Francisco hotel room and you feel him before he even comes through the wall, you know there's a God. Because you know there's a devil. And I tell you, when you don't believe in something more than science can explain stuff, kind of paradigm, just go to any rural village where there is no medicine, no hospital, I've been there, and as, uh, what's the word, as popular as ABC stores are in Hawaii, <laughs> so are witch doctor offices who do curses and voodoo and black magic and witchcraft to do whatever you want to do, good or bad. And that's the demonic powers. So I can't show you an angel, but man, I can show you a demon. If you really want to see it, you will find the truth. And when you realize that this is the path that God has you on, this is truth. But then there are lies. Oh, you're ugly. There is no God. You'll never get married. There is no hope. There is no purpose. You know what? No one's going to miss you if you're not even here. Just give up. These were the lies that I was believing. And at age 10, I tried to end my life in a bathtub. Can you imagine if I went through with that? Look how much I would have missed out on. Look at what beautiful blessings came out of my broken pieces. I was wrong every time I concluded I would never get married. I got married. I can't hold my wife's hand. Yeah, you know what? That's true. I don't need to hold her hand. I just need to hold her heart. How are you going to hold your kids when they're crying? What kind of a father are you going to be? Well, I'm going to be the father as best as I can be that when my kids cry, that maybe I can't put my arms around them, but they want to come and put their arms around me. Yeah. It's a paradigm shift of thinking when you find the truth. You girls, your royalty. You guys, your generals in the army of God. I'm an ambassador of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm a child of God. And man, when those lies come my way, and you know where the lies come from, from the pit of hell, you say, you know what, I ain't listening. You can talk to the foot because the ears ain't listening. And you turn around and shake it off, shake it off. And you just take one step at a time. God, help me to love you and serve you and know you. Teach me to pray. Show me how to live. Because there's nothing here on earth that satisfies my soul. I'm on my way to heaven and I want to bring as many people with me as we can.
No amount of drugs or alcohol or any high or, or pleasure can ever take away our shame or our guilt. That's more disabling than this. Do you see this smile? It's because I know I'm not dying. Do you see this smile? Because I know my dad's not dead. I'm going to see him again. You see this smile? I'm alive, man. I'm alive. You're alive. God's not done with you yet. And sometimes we put faith in our intellect. Sometimes plans of what we have for the future. And if I can just get this, if I can just get that, if I can just pay off my house and get a couple investment properties. No. Tomorrow is not promised for anyone. Who are you and what do you want? You'll know what I want. That one day I see God face to face. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. If you look at it in an illustrative way, like a courtroom, God is the judge, my accuser, the devil, he's over there, and he points at Nick. God, because the devil believes in God. God, this is Nicholas Vujicic, and I have a record of all of his sins. He's done this, 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 six years later, six, this, 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 twelve years later, this, 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 this. He is guilty. Then Jesus stands next to me. He says, Father, at 15 years old, Nick read in John chapter 9 in the Bible about how I healed the blind man. And it touched Nick's life to believe that if I had a plan for the blind man, you had a plan for the blind man, that you had a plan for him. And at age 15, he asked for the forgiveness of all his sins. And he asked me into his life. And he believed that I died for all of his sins, just like it happened. His sins, Father, are forgiven because you sent me to die for them. And he believed in it. And then he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then when I'm in heaven, was one thing I wonder if this will actually happen. This will be so cool if it does, but this is what I want. That one day, I'm in heaven, raising my hands, worshiping God. <laughs> right? And then he, my name. Hey, Nick! And I'll look. And it'll be Daniel, the little boy with no arms and legs, now a grown man running to me with his new legs, hugging me with his new arms, crying. I'm sure we're going to cry in joy and say, he's going to say, thank you, brother, for helping me believe that this place called heaven was real. To me, that moment where Daniel spends eternity now, or arms and legs for 90 years, I mean, aren't arms and legs going to give me arthritis later on anyway? I mean, <laughs> sorry I had to say that, but, but truly, what do we want? You know, some of us believers need to just get a recalibration of our mind to remember what our true north is, that our satisfaction ain't horizontal. It's when we look up, amen? Can I have Leilani play some piano here? Please, that'll be great. I'd, I'd play piano, but I'm not warmed up yet. <laughs> Guys, I want to share with you just a couple stories real quick. I want to ask you first, though, is your hope real? Do you have hope? If you go to sleep tonight and you don't wake up, where do you wake up? Are you okay with not knowing? You can't just say, well, no one really knows. I want you to know that you can either believe someone what they say or not. And you yourself can go search out for the truth, seek it out or not. That's your choice. But if you really believe that you have hope, a great way to know if you have hope is if you put it to the test. How would you ever put your hope to the test? Well, let's try doing it this way. What would you do and what would you say in front of 650 teenagers who were kidnapped at 10 years old, 
or sold by their mother for $700 at 10 years old, forced into prostitution. Some people say, well, just be positive. You can't tell them that. Some people believe in reincarnation. What, what are you going to tell them? Better luck next time? Is that hope? Really? I can't even tell them to be that, uh, uh, become part of the national religion there in India as, as Hindi because as human trafficked girls, you are already an outcast. You are on the lowest, 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 lowest rank of society. I can't tell them to be actually any other religion. Do your research. Don't ever be a Christian just because of a Christian. Don't ever be a Christian just because of a church. Because if you're a Christian because of a Christian or a church, you're not going to be Christian for long. A Christian, by definition, is a follower of Jesus Christ because of who he was and what he said and what he did and what he did what he said and what he said what he did. I am a Christian follower of Jesus. But do your research and find that there is no other assurance of hope or salvation, redemption, forgiveness, breaking the shackles of shame, condemnation, guilt, except for Jesus. And I told them about Jesus and I told them about heaven. And I told them about the power of the Holy Spirit. That when he enters in you, he transforms you. And some of these girls got rescued. They went to a Jesus camp, got totally transformed, found a job, saved up money, 700 bucks, went back to the brothel houses where they were once a slave. It's a 10 acre red light city district in Mumbai, 250 houses with six girls in each at any given time, plus the underground. They went back there with a bucket of water and a white towel. And they knocked on the door where they used to be a slave and their former master opens up the door. And they say, who are you? They say, I used to be your slave, but I've come here today to tell you I love you, that I know you're broken and you're not happy and you don't know what to do to find happiness. And I've come here today to tell you that Jesus is the answer. And I'm praying for your soul. And I love you. And I forgive you. I forgive you because he forgave me. And he took my shame. And he took my guilt. And he took my sin. And he took my past. And he gave me a brand new life. And I want you to live a brand new life. And not live this life anymore. I'm praying for you. And I've come here with a bucket of water and a towel to wash your feet. To show you that I love you. And I forgive you. And these guys are, and women are just weeping, weeping, weeping. When they're done, they say, here's 700 bucks. Give me a slave. They take that slave as their own adopted sister, take him to the Jesus camp, help them find a job, save up money, both of them together, twice as fast to go back and rescue another one and another one and another one. Ladies and gentlemen, if that's not redemption, I don't know what is. Redemption. one of those houses, my last story I want to share, there was an old woman, she was like 90, 95 years old, skin and bone, on the floor, couldn't walk for four and a half years. I didn't know who she was, but the friend who brought me there did. He didn't want to tell me who she was. So I started talking to her about Jesus. And her sister comes in and says, I don't want to hear about your white man God anymore. I've heard enough about this Jesus man. Show me his power. If he's real, make her walk. I said, excuse me? She said, show me that your God is real. She hasn't walked for four and a half years. So I said a quick prayer in my heart. I said, God, just in case you're not aware of what's going on, I'm about to pray for a woman who apparently haven't, hasn't walked for four and a half years. Please do your will, whatever it is. But I have faith and we're going to pray. So we prayed, and it was incredible. The first time she tried to get up, it was very heart-wrenching for me 
because you could see the excruciating pain on her face as this old woman tried to get vertical up, upright. She couldn't be any weight-bearing ounce of pressure at all on her feet. And she wasn't paralyzed, but man, she may as well have been. She couldn't stand up at all. We sat her back down on a chair. And I said, no, God, we're going to pray more. We massaged her knees and her calves, and we prayed a little bit more. All of a sudden, she used to have a tremor like this and hunched over like this. All of a sudden, in her own words, she's like, electricity just went through me. And her tremor stopped, and she went upright like this in the chair. And she says, I want to walk. And I'm like, what? She said, I want to walk. I said, no, no, we need to pray a lot longer, honey. All right, you don't understand. Like, you, tiny, 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 little bit of faith in the one and true living God. You can put oceans of faith in stuff that don't work, but when you put your faith in God, all you need is a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of faith. She said, I want to walk. She got up like she never stopped walking. She started jumping up and down on those skinny, skinny legs. I was afraid she was going to break the legs that God just healed. She is shouting for joy, punching the roof. Her sister who challenged the faith went to the wall of gods that they worship and said to them, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I said, no, 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 that was not your God. That was Jesus. Haven't you been praying for four and a half years? I said, yes. I said, that was not your God. Jesus resurrected. He's alive. They are not real or they never resurrected. You have a God for every little thing. I think they have either 33 million gods or 300 million gods in that religion. And I said, that was Jesus. And he loves you very, very much. Two weeks later, the lady who walked gave her life to Jesus. But that night we went back to the hotel. And the friend who took me there he was an Indian guy, and it's hard for an Indian guy to look pale, but he looked pale. And he said, that was crazy. I said, that was awesome. He said, no, Nick, you don't understand who she was. He said, the woman who walked tonight, who got the miracle, wasn't any old woman. She was the woman who in the 1960s started that red light district, 10 acres, 250 houses plus the underground world she started human trafficking in our city she is the top of the chain talk about doing something wrong talk about 40,000 slaves later 50 years in the making talk about running a million miles an hour in the wrong direction Yet God's love pursued her. God's love pursues you. And He runs faster than you. And His love conquers all sin. And no sin separates you from His love. So even with your pornographic addiction, He loves you. Because He doesn't see your addiction. He sees your heart as His lost child. He's saying, come home. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to do it on your own. Surrender. God will never shortchange you. We can't bring back the past. But from this day on, He can heal you from the past one day at a time. Change your addictions, your thinking patterns. Renew your mind. Give you joy and peace, what you're really looking for. And it's real, my brother. And it's real, my sister. I'm not disabled. I'm flying on the wings of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mean that I don't cry. And it doesn't mean that I'm perfect. Far from perfect. Just ask my wife. But when you turn away from the lies and the life of sin, now I want to live for God. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. But I start that journey with that first step of faith. And I want to help you to make that first step. It starts with a prayer. And I'm going to call you forward. Why do I call you forward? Because if you can't stand up for your faith in here, how can you expect to stand up for your faith out there? Pretty simple. 
And when you come forward, you don't have to be worried. I'm not going to lay hands on you or anything. <laughs> but there's been at least 250 to 300 people come forward in the last four services. So I'm expecting at least 10 right now. If you know that you need to make your life right with Jesus, grab your things, grab your purse, grab your belongings, grab your wallet, grab your phone, grab whatever you brought with you right now, put it in your lap and make that decision right now to say, you know what? I'm going to start my faith journey with Jesus. I'm going to ask him to be my savior because I'm done doing things my way. I'm done playing games. Some of you teenagers think that you're actually Christian because you come to church. It doesn't make you a Christian. Some of you worship God on Sundays and tease people at school on Monday. I don't know if you really know the love of God then. I think it's time to get real. Some of you older men think that you're just fine to do your status quo. No, daily, live for Him. God's not done with you yet. He wants to use you in different ways. Are you actively saved with Jesus in a relationship? And if you want to begin that relationship with Jesus, this is not a rededication, but starting a real relationship with Him, I want you right now, stand up on your feet and come forward right now. If you see someone standing and coming forward, come forward right now. If you know you need to give your life to Jesus, come right at the front. You don't have to stand at your seat. Come right at the front. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is always tomorrow. Come right here in the middle. Come on, don't think about it for too long. Stop thinking about thinking about it. Just stand up and come. It's already done. He wants to take away your depression. He wants to take away your loneliness, the affliction, the oppression. He has a brand new life waiting for you. They're coming from the top. Another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people coming from the top. Another one here. Another one there. Awesome. So far, we got 45 people up the front. I'm going to wait for at least another 30. If you know that you need to make your life right with Jesus, stand right now and come forward. Right now. If you don't want to come alone, turn to the person next to you and say, Hey, I really want to come up there. I really want to say that prayer. I really want to say this prayer to God. I really want to go up the front. I just don't want to go alone. Will you please come up with me? And they'll say yes. Trust me. Right now, this is the last and final call. If you know you need to make your life right with Jesus, stand to your feet and come on down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. That's twenty-three more people. Come on, let's give God a shout of praise. Come on, we're not done yet. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33. 34, 35, 36. They're still coming down. Look, there's 10 people on the stairs coming down right now. Two people there. do a quick shuffle if everyone can move that way about 10 feet that's great and then get out of the aisles guys push forward let the guys come out of the aisles you guys move across move across double up double up triple up we're going to try and move all those people this way a little bit just shuffle 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 awesome there's about 180 people up the front let's give God a shout of praise amen
let's bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to pray first. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your love. Thank you, God, for your plans that you have for us. They're good plans, not of evil. Thank you for your thoughts that are not evil but good towards us. Father, we thank you that you are God indeed. And Lord, we pray for anyone who's going through a physical situation where they need a physical miracle. In the name of Jesus, we pray for every sickness and disease to be healed in the name of Jesus. But Father, above a physical miracle is the miracle of knowing you. Thank you, God, for these people up the front who have taken their first step of faith to know you as their Lord and Savior. God, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for heaven. Change us, renew us, and help us to know you more every single day. If you're up the front, please repeat this, repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, I thank you for your love and for the plans for my life. I want to know you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I'm so sorry of everything I've done wrong. From this day on, I confess that you are my Lord, my King, my everything. I want to know you. Change me. I do not want to sin. I want to live for you, to serve you, to know you. Holy Spirit, fill me right now with your peace, with your comfort, and your strength. Teach me to pray and help me to know you more and more each and every day. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. And thank you, God, for heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give God a shout of praise. You know, when one person comes to Jesus, all of heaven stops to rejoice. And we rejoice with you. And I want you to know that we're a family of God. What you see is what you get, right? Uh, with, with us, we're authentic. This church is authentic. We love you. There is nothing that you'll ever tell us that will change our love for you. You don't have to tell us what you don't want to tell us, but we're here to listen in whatever you want to say. Uh, we're here to encourage you in every single way. If you need groceries, we'll get your groceries. If you have 100 prayer requests, We'll pray for each and every prayer request. We stand by you as a family member in prayer for your breakthrough and your family's breakthrough. Do you see my body? I am your half brother, all right? And uh, there's nothing that can change that. It's because of the blood of Jesus, amen? I love you guys so much, and we want you to know that this is the beginning. Tomorrow morning, you might wake up and wonder, well, what do I do now? We want to help you with the what now. And if you don't have a home church, please know that this is your home church. You're welcome back every single Sunday here. And if you're a young person, they also have youth weekly meetings. It's good to gather around with people who are like-minded, who do like uh, the, 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 the celebration of God and the celebration of life and, and being a family, encouraging each other, praying for one another. We also lastly... I know we've taken 90 minutes of your life, but I'm asking you right now if you can give us three more minutes of the, your morning right now, because in a moment, we're going to take you through some doors that way, and we have, they call it decision cards or information cards, that you're one of these people that said yes to Jesus for the first time, and we want to just get your details down. We'll never ask you to do something you don't want to do. We just want to follow up with you, give you a phone call, give you an email and say, hey, what can we pray for? How can we help you? How can we pray for your family? Help us to help you with the next steps because you now are starting a brand new life 
and babies only drink milk. They don't eat a filet mignon for a couple years, right? At least till four years old anyway. But I just want you to know that it's like a spiritual newborn baby, we can help you with the first steps and it's wonderful to gather weekly. So Pastor John, did you want to say anything before we head them out that way? Welcome home. Can we let them know welcome home, you guys, each and every one of you? The courageous step that you've just taken in front of everybody, God is going to reward you in this because now you got a front row seat to the biggest miracle of your life because now fear is not in the driver's seat. Faith is. Jesus is going to take you farther than you've ever gone before. And the people that are looking at your back, they have your back. That's the thing we want you to know and the reason why we want you to join us right outside for a couple minutes is because when you fill this out, you're going to get this. This is your Aloha Pass experience. Because we figure, like Nick said, if heaven is throwing a party right now, then you know what? Can we throw a party too? And so we're so glad you guys came here this week. We're hoping you'll join us next week because right outside, we're going to have a place reserved just for you with a special gift with coffee, with uh, donuts, and and the pastors are going to be out there because we want to be able to meet you. But most of all, we want you to know that you are not alone in this journey of faith. I've never seen anything like this in the history of New Hope outside of Easter weekends where over the course of five services we've seen over 500 people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Can we give glory to God for that? Thank you Jesus. Thank you each and every one of you. We want to join you in this journey of faith. Now I know you brought your belongings because I told you to bring your belongings and so there was a reason for that and so it's just going to be a couple minutes out that way. If I see you go back to your seats, don't tempt me to come up there and drag you back down, okay? So right now everyone turn your bodies this way and start walking out that door. Let's give God a shout of praise, amen. Yes. I know it's tempting, don't go back, just be patient, be patient, they're moving. Thank you so much for your patience, don't go back to your seats. If you're watching online and you made that life-changing conscious decision to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, uh, please click on that button, it should be on your screen, it should say something like, I said yes to Jesus. Click on that so then we can register your email and that we can follow up with you as well. May God bless you uh, from wherever you're watching. And I just feel, may God bless the continuing influence that New Hope has, not just here in Hawaii, but also in Japan. Um, I feel just such a burden for, for the islands, but know that we're not on the defense. We're on, uh, not the offense, I'm going to say, but we really are on the front line of God's army taking over territory because of his unconditional love for the lost. Amen. So keep on pressing forward one step at a time. Please pray for Life Without Limbs. I encourage you to go to our website. We have no resources here. Uh, We're always praying for monthly supporters as well. Um, We're so excited to be coming back in November, Lord willing. And we just want to say to New Hope, thank you for your love. May God continue to shine in and through all of you. And God bless you, John. And thanks for having us here. May God be praised. Great things are yet to come. But how awesome. 500 souls over five services. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Can we give Nick a hand, you guys? Let's stand and welcome them into the kingdom of God, you guys. This is so beautiful, you guys. Thank you for making this courageous stand for Jesus Christ. You are not ashamed of him on earth, and he will not be ashamed of you in heaven. You will look back on this day as the day that you step from death into life, from darkness into light. And we stand with you in this journey of faith. What each one up here has chosen over all the last services, they have said, I'm putting my hope and my trust for my future in Christ alone. Not in a program, not in a person, but Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, as they're walking out, let's sing that over them right now. Christ alone, our cornerstone. Christ alone.